So it's my great pleasure to be in conversation today with Dr. Gabriel Siles Brugger from our own department. Uh, professor Siles Brugger is Associate Professor in Public Policy with research interests in issues of trade, particularly the politics of trade and investment negotiations um, and munici um, municipalities and global trade and investment governance. Gabriel is the co-author of TTIP, The Truth About Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Policy uh, Partnership, which you know that we have discussed in class. And in uh, this was in 2016. And in 2014, he wrote Constructing European Union Trade Policy, a global idea of Europe. And of course, we have also talked about sort of, you know, the global and Europe in terms of trade. So uh, for both those reasons, I'm delighted that uh, Gabriel is uh, w willing and able to talk to us today. Um, Gabriel worked um, from July uh, 2017 to 2019 uh, as one of the very first parliamentary academic fellows advising the UK House of Commons International Trade Committee, combining his academic research and his policy work. So I'm really looking forward to having his insights, which are not just academic, but also policy oriented, which I'm sure you will appreciate. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, one of the members of that committee, who is a my local MP, thinks the world of Gabriel's um, uh, interventions in, in that field. Gabriel is also a scientific advisor to the European Public Health Alliance and was appointed as one of the organization's representatives on the European Commission Directorate General for Trades Expert Group on uh, Trade Agreements. Um, and I just am very much looking forward to uh, talking to him about issues in trade and development today. So, uh, Gabe, thanks very much for agreeing to take part in this conversation. No, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure and, and it's a really kind introduction, Shirin. Uh, so let's start. Um, and I was looking at your work, of course, in preparation for this conversation. And uh, in a recent piece that you have on COVID-19, you pointed out, and I quote, the debate around trade and investment policy seems to be polarizing around two positions. On one hand, the pandemic has led to a more securitized discourse on the relationship between health and trade. And on the other, liberals have re-emphasized the merits of an open trading system. You also pointed, and I, quotes closed, you also pointed out that, um, and again, I quote, you uh, missing in such uh, binary trade policy debates is a more comprehensive consideration of the complex interactions that exist between trade, investment and public health. So given that we are sort of, you know, experiencing not only the pandemic, but a kind of a nasty COVID nationalism, um, do you think trade can address public health needs of poorer countries? Well, I mean, I think as the and thanks a lot for 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 um, for reading that piece and 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 engaging with it. I guess you know, as as the quotation suggests, I think the problem is seeing trade as either you know the source of all evil or 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 the panacea to the problems of of COVID, um, and ultimately what you need is the right policy mix. Um, but obviously, you know, the devil's in the detail, as they say. So let's let's talk specifics. Um, so on one hand, you know, COVID nationalism when you see that rep. Uh, Amplified through, for example, restrictions on the export of essential medical goods. You know, we saw, for example, restrictions on the exports of personal protective equipment early on in the pandemic, um, or of vaccines, as we're currently seeing in the context of, of the European Union. I mean, I think this is really bad news from the perspective of poor countries, which are less likely to have uh, manufacturing capacity themselves, and of course, are less likely to be able to afford the sort of higher prices that, you know, that will induce on, on global markets for vaccines and or uh, PPE. Um, more generally, of course, these sorts of restrictions on the movements of these essential goods can have impacts on, on the existing supply chains that exist globally. Um, and, you know, you know, this can lead to less production and more expensive goods. Right. So this in and of itself is, is bad news, I think. Um, so in this sense, I think, you know, what you do need to have in the trade system is, 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 is or the trade system needs to allow you to be able to ramp up production and distribute 
you know, equitably. Um, so you need to, you know, have a trade system that prevents the hoarding of medical supplies by those states with access to production facilities, right? And those tend to be concentrated in the in the global north. Um, and you know, this of course is, is is really a real problem around you know the COVID nationalism, the more securitized discourse around around COVID. Um, but of course, I think just having the free movement of goods uh, and investment isn't isn't the solution, right? Because you know that by that might still leave a number of countries without adequate access to medical goods, uh, without some sort of intervention in the market. And of course, we're already seeing with developing countries. You know, I remember seeing a graphic in the Economist, quite a stark one, um, talking about you know availability of of the vaccine across different countries, right? And and there's a very sort of north south dynamic there, right? With with some countries in the global south not having access to the vaccine fully until 2023, right? Um, so, you know, this is actually where potentially some of the rules that exist to govern trade globally are problematic, um, both in terms of the rules that exist at the WTO level and in terms of the sort of rules that often build on the WTO rules that exist in, in uh, bilateral agreements between countries, right? Mm. Um, and so here, a lot of concerns often raised around rules around intellectual property rights. So at the WTO level, you have what's called the Trade uh, Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreements, the TRIPS Agreement, um, and you know all signatories to that, which of course includes a number of developing countries, um, have to have a system for protecting patents in place. And of course, you know a number of the bilateral agreements that, 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 that developing countries will have signed up to go beyond the sort of protections that exist under, under TRIPS. And of course, patents, what the patents are ultimately about are about establishing a, a monopoly for the, the holder of the patent to produce and, and, and to sell a particular good. Um, and this, of course, you know, um, allows, you know, the, the, the patent holder to um, potentially, uh, you know, to, to gate, you know, to have, to have um, you know, to demand prices for the production of, of and, uh, for their pharmaceutical and other medical supplies. Mm-hmm. Um, and also to limit supply potentially. And this might also limit supply, right? Because, you know, you have a monopoly producer. Um, and so, of course, this, you know, has consequences when it comes to the access to, to medicines across uh, and the equitable distribution of medicines across uh, the world. Um, now, obviously, under TRIPS, you do have some flexibilities for what's called compulsory licensing, i.e. a situation where a country would compensate the patent holder and then produce generic versions of the, of the vaccine. There's also some flexibilities to allow for the export of vaccines, uh, of generically produced vaccines um, for those countries that might not have production facilities themselves. Um, but it's fair to say that, you know, the TRIPS agreement and other bilateral agreements that go beyond TRIPS that might restrict compulsory licensing still act as a deterrent on using the flexibilities mm-hmm. that might exist. Um, and or, um, you know, of course, you know, being able to issue compulsory licensing doesn't necessarily address some of the sort of, you know, technical know-how to produce the vaccines, right? Um, and also, you know, it doesn't address the fact that certain elements of the production process of a vaccine might themselves also be subject to intellectual property rights protection. Um, and then, of course, you have the whole sort of, you know, problem of securing regulatory approval for um, generic variants, right? So and in a situation here where, where time is of the essence, you know, any sort of yeah. delays become really problematic. Um, and, you know, in effect, you know, all these sorts of elements of the trading system can act as a constraint on on sort of quickly producing and developing accessible, sorry, um, affordable uh, medicines. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just sort of quite a complicated picture. I think hoarding vaccines and, and, and limiting the circulation can be problematic. But at the same time, I think the trading system in general needs to think, take more, more, heed of the the sort of health policy implications of certain rules which are written there basically to facilitate free movement of goods and services and and in the case of intellectual property rights to protect patent holders um, and other intellectual property rights holders but you know are obviously potentially problematic in terms of ensuring an equitable distribution of of uh, of medical goods including vaccines so, um, Gabe, can I ask a sub, sort of a, a follow-up question really I I sort of um and i'm sorry if i, I i'm not trying to trip you up haha no. <laughs> but uh, but given that trips i mean that whole thing about generic um, medicines uh, 
and TRIPS was kind of raised also during um, the AIDS pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, um, in South Africa, that was the famous case and uh, sort of, you know, that um, they refused to, I mean, they wanted to get generic um, uh, retrovirals from India and uh, the Supreme Court in, in South Africa decided in favor of that because people were dying. So has that kind of earlier hinterland of trade kind of um, uh, issues um, affected uh, the COVID sort of, you know, um, vaccination issues now or not really? Or is that separate legal um, framework? No, I mean, I think I think there are probably more flexibilities now. So there was, you know, there was the, the problem that existed was effectively the, the, the sort of issue I alluded to earlier, which was, you know, this problem of you know, uh, if you yourself as a country didn't have manufacturing capacity, you couldn't rely on the compulsory licensing of a medicine elsewhere and import that medicine because that would still be a violation of your requirements under the TRIPS agreement. And so that that issue, to an extent, has been addressed by, you know, the addition of a new paragraph to uh, to the, the TRIPS agreement. I, if I, I think I seem to remember it's Article 31 bis. Um, but uh, the problem is, in a sense, that A, you have still other trade agreements where, you know, there might be restrictions on compulsory licensing and B, you know, it's quite technical, right? You need to get into the detail, you know, you need to, you know, there's still, you know, sort of processes to follow. And of course, all that requires certain amounts of technical capacity and, it, and all of that slows down, you know, the process of, you know, of having access to, 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 to vaccines and producing, you know, potentially generic varieties. So my point is, you know, the situation is better than what it used to be. But it's, you know, it's it's still a sort of, you know, let's say, I don't know what the right metaphor is here, but, you know, it's still sand in the cogwheels of, of you know, of, yeah. of, of the global health system, if you will, you know. Um, Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, I think that's that's pretty clear. And also, of course, then that gets even more overlain with this whole business of nationalism, which is just so ridiculous. But anyways, um, the other thing that we have been sort of um, thinking about in um, our class and in terms of trade, uh, which your book sort of, you know, um, the truth about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership um, addresses is sort of, you know, also um, uh, neoliberal trade and whether it has, it, it is a game changer. So in your book, you argue, and I sort of quote again, thanks to unprecedented levels of protest and debate around TTIP. However, neoliberal trade negotiations are well and truly back in the spotlight. In this respect, TTIP could well prove to be a game changer, just not in the way imagined by its backers. What do you mean by this? And particularly, mm. what do you mean by this in the context of the global South countries, which is mm. what um, the class would be interested in? Yeah, so I mean, it feels like a long time ago, uh, <laughs> the days when TTIP was the biggest thing to worry about. But um, yeah, so I guess, you know, this idea of TTIP as a game changer, at, at, at least the, what the quotation is making allusion to is this idea that from a sort of policymaker perspective in, 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 uh, in you know, the EU and the US, TTIP was a game changer because what it would allow is the EU and the US to sort of reassert their sort of position as, as leading economies in terms of setting rules, um, you know, for, for, for global trade, you know, around, for example, intellectual property, but more importantly around, you know, product standards, um, uh, you know, um, and, and this is sort of, you know, TTIP in a sense is the culmination of a broader trend away from sort of negotiating the real sort of nitty gritty substance of, of global trading uh, rules at the WTO to sort of bilateral fora, you know, either, you know, negotiations between, you know, the EU and the US with, with developing countries or in the case of TTIP amongst themselves. And in a sense, this is about sort of bypassing the deadlock that emerged in, in the Doha development round between, you know, uh, um, sort of rising emerging powers um, uh, and, you know, notably Brazil, India, and to an extent China and, you know, the EU and the US. Um, and of course, this is quite problematic if you think about it. I mean, TTIP was problematic for a number of other reasons, but in the sort of global south context specifically, um, you know, it, it was problematic because what it effectively represented is an attempt to bypass mm. the sort of decision making the decision making body that is the WTO. And of course, the WTO has all sorts of problems. You know, there are all sorts of you know asymmetries in terms of you know how the rules are set up um, to favor you know the interests of of, of, of certain developed countries. Um, but at the very you know at least it represents a sort of body driven by you know 
consensus-based decision-making, uh, at least formally. Um, and so, you know, and, and at least, you know, quite a few developing countries are represented there. And so, you know, when you then move from, a system, from, from sort of multilateral governance to, you know, this sort of, you know, preferential trade agreement, you know, all of this is sort of undermined. Um, the other thing, of course, the WTO has is the Apple, sorry, the, the dispute settlement system, although that's, we can get to that at some other point because it's, of course, in, in, in trouble at the moment. But, you know, that allowed, you know, developing countries to challenge the policies of the EU and the US as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that's why, why, you know, from a European or US perspective, you know, TTIP was a, a game changer. Um, but, of course, you know, it didn't turn out as, as they expected. Um, and so, what we're, I mean, th this quotation makes allusion to the fact that, in a, in a sense, TTIP uh, uh, brought about quite a bit of civil society protest in Europe, mainly, um, against uh, the agreement. Not because of the reasons I've just talked about, largely. I mean, of course, there were sort of concerns raised by development-focused uh, NGOs around the sort of impacts that TTIP might have on, on developing countries. Um, but, you know, mainly around sort of the impact that this would have on, on you know, on standards in, in, in Europe and, and, in, and in the US, right? There was the image of the chlorinated chicken, right? Yes. You know, the idea being that, you know, Europeans would have to eat chickens washed in chlorine, you know, because of the agreement. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was very much a global north, let's call it, mobilization of activists. Um, and, um, you know, of course, you know, Eventually, you know, sort of ran into the doldrums, I think, largely because of the election of Donald Trump, but also, I think, because, you know, the whole negotiation momentum was slowed down because of these protests. Um, so linking this to the global south, I think, you know, if I was going to stay optimistic, it's that these sorts of moments of mobilization, in a way, provide an opportunity for activists to link up, right? And so it's fair to say, I think, that there are broader, sort of more globalized networks of activism on trade politics. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these are still centered on, 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 you know, NGOs in the global north, right? Think your Council of Canadians in Canada or, you know, uh, in, in Europe, there's this so-called, uh, this network called Seattle to Brussels. But, you know, it is fair to say that there have been attempts to, to link up with NGOs in the global south around the MAI, for example. So that's the multilateral agreement on investment that was being negotiated in the late 90s. You know, a lot of sort of sort of key leaks came, I think, from organizations based in, 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 in global South countries. Um, subsequently, in the, in the sort of, you know, period of contention around the general agreement on trade and services, which was all about, you know, liberalizing uh, uh, trade and services, including, you know, for example, municipal water services or, you know, other publicly delivered services. You know, there was sort of, you know, a sort of a campaign that saw itself as explicitly global. Um, it was quite active um, and actually did a good job of linking various levels of governance. So, you know, um, you mentioned earlier that I do work on, on, on municipalities and trade. So actually what happened was that you had, you know, activists that were framing their activism in the, in the language of sort of, you know, global solidarity at the same time as those activists and those groups in their local chapters were pressuring local municipalities in, in various countries to pass critical motions um, against these various agreements. And you saw that also with TTIP. So, you know, an interesting sort of, you know, multi-level form of, of activism. Um, and so, you know, if I was going to be optimistic, I'd say, you know, there's the possibility for forming these transnational links. It's fair to say that, you know, the activism is often found most publicly when it's focused on issues of concern to the global north. Um, but um, I think, you know, that doesn't mean we shouldn't, I think, try and cre create more room for these sorts of connections between North and South. And, you know, in some cases, for example, the EU's negotiations with, with African, Caribbean and Pacific groups of states, these sorts of, you know, transnational campaigns have actually, you know, managed to sort of reduce the sort of, you know, let's call it neoliberal content of these trade agreements. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess it's a mixed picture here, I think. But, um, you know, I, I try and stay optimistic in the current <laughs> I think it's fascinating also because you have been able to bring to bear sort of, you know, this whole kind of public campaign against um, these uh, sort of trade um, sort of uh, treaties. And, and so my question there would be that sort of given it's Europe and um, the United States coming together, um, uh, so what happens in the post, you said sort of, you know, it's kind of run to the ground, um, and, but we've also got now the new kind of trade agreements, haven't we, with the Canadians as well. And mm -hmm. so I'm just thinking, are we kind of headed towards, 
more regional focus on on these trade agreements now as a result of this i mean sort of you know because this was seen to be such a big moment in trade negotiations or or sort of what do you think yeah so i mean i guess canada cita um so this was an agreement that started being negotiated when i was doing my phd still um right. so and at the time it wasn't seen as particularly important um but i think it gained an importance largely because of ttip right and it sort of coincided, the sort of end game with that negotiation coincided with the whole hullabaloo around TTIP. Um, and the agreement itself also became politicized because of um, the sort of investor protection provi uh, provisions that were also included in CETA. And they were subsequently reformed, arguably not enough. Um, and, you know, so, so you know, CETA in a sense is part of the TTIP story, although it's still ongoing because, um, you know, there's a sort of national process of, of ratification related to that, um, even if the agreement is, is provisionally applied. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting is, of course, that, you know, I think this trend towards bilateralism and, and, and you know, by, 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 sorry, by bilateral, of course, I'm also including bi-regional negotiations, yeah. for example, between the EU and, and Mercosur, um, you know, is, is, I think, you know, is there, you know, and I think, you know, in terms of negotiating dynamics, okay, there are some initiatives, you know, linked to the WTO, uh, around sort of you know you know negotiating on on trade and services although that's arguably dormant at the moment or or on environmental goods you know the sort of thrust of negotiation is in these bilateral agreements um, and there for example we recently had a sort of agreement in principle on you know between the EU and Mercosur and the EU and Mercosur have been negotiating since the late 90s you know so this is like you know a big a big deal um, quite controversial because of the impacts that you know because of the link climate you know, um, deforestation in the Amazon and, and, and you know, facilitation of exports of beef, right? Um, yeah, so in terms of, you know, I think, you know, this this trend of, of bilateralism, you know, although TTIP in some ways was, was the most ambitious of these agreements to come out of that, I, I think that trend is here, you know, um, and, you know, with, with the WTO, you know, uh, being undermined under Trumpism, um, you know, um, I think it's, it's it's kind of here to stay to an extent, you know, I think. Right. I mean, so now that we are talking about uh, a WTO, I mean, where do you think it's going? I mean, there's the the death knell of WTO has been rung. And <laughs> at the same time, there's still a lot of mobilization and anger about WTO in the Global South campaigning groups. Mm. Uh, and also you've got the rise of, of nationalist populism um, in not just in the global south with Trump, but also in the global north. Look at my country, India, sort of, you know, with the Modi. And, um, and then you've got the rise of China and the Belt and Road Initiative, which is really terrifying the Europeans as to sort of, you know, how trade will be affected um, um, it, through that. So sort of, you know, what do you think that multilateral kind of body, and then as we have just been talking about, there's also the sort of increase in bilateralism um, mm -hmm. rather than those multilateral regulatory bodies, which was sort of, you know. So where do you see the trajectory of trade regulation going in the next couple of decades, especially the, the kind of place of WTO, which was like, it's such a young organization, um, and yet it is, already being sort of written off. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I have counted myself as one of the critics of the WTO, particularly pre, pre-Trump. And, and, and I think, you know, um, you know, sort of, you know, unilateralism you see, you know, or reinforced unilateralism in the US, of course, you know, sort of made me, you know, reevaluate the merits in some ways of the organization. I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm reminded of the book uh, Rawdon Wilkinson wrote, you know, what's wrong with the WTO and how to fix it, in which he says, you know, we need a world trade organization, but, you know, maybe not the one that we have. Um, and so, I mean, here, I think, you know, it's, it's useful maybe, you know, in terms of reflecting on what's happening in terms of, you know, Trump, the BRI and, and, and you know, the rise of China, as well as, you know, the future to sort of break things, well, to sort of maybe critically interrogate some of the narratives that exist around the WTO. Um, so, you know, one is, you know, this idea that, you know, the U.S. has historically been the guarantor um, of this wonderful system of free trade, you know, um, and, you know, Trump is an aberration in that sense. So, you know, before the WTO, you had the, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, which, you know, uh, much of which was in uh, incorporated into the WTO, right? Um, it was a much arrangement, but, you know, its, its objectives were broadly comparable. 
And, you know, the idea was that the U.S. is the guarantor of the WTO and the guarantor of, of the GATT. And then the second, you know, sort of big idea is that, you know, as the U.S. sort of loses in relative position vis-a-vis -vis the likes of China and, and India, um, and, you know, China in particular increasingly free rides, you know, because, you know, it's benefiting from free trade, but pursuing all sorts of subsidies, interventions, support for its SOEs. Um, you know, this obviously, you know, the argument is undermines the sort of trading system. Um, but I think, you know, what this sort of very binary, I think, narrative neglects is, is, is a number of things. One is that, you know, the U.S. has historically had a very ambivalent relationship, particularly to the WTO. Um, you know, I mean, in a sense, for example, the, the dispute settlement system that exists in the WTO was set up to sort of rein in U.S. unilateralism of the 1980s. You know, so the U.S. had, you know, was, had, you know, was quite uh, aggressive in its pursuit of, you know, a strategy of maximizing its exports, minimizing imports. Um, and tackling what it perceived was unfair trade barriers uh, in the 1980s. And so, of course, you've seen that again now, but it's not, you know, and of course, Trump is much more, has been, or was much more strident um, about, you know, the way he pursued that and, and much less sort of committed to the sort of rhetoric of multilateralism, let's say. Um, but that sort of reticence and um, to engage with an organization that is perceived as a sort of constraint on US sovereignty is not new. Um, and as we saw, you know, which leads me to the second point, which is that even before Trump, there was a sort of trend to sort of marginalizing the sort of negotiating function of the WTO anyway. You know, I think in 2015, you know, it was, you know, the Doha round was already declared dead. Right. So this is pre-Trump. And, you know, you saw the US and the EU, of course, pursuing TTIP, but also a whole raft of other bilaterals. So, you know, let's not forget that. And then finally, you know, alluding to, to Rawdon's book and, and the work of many others, of course, um, you know, it's fair to say that, you know, I think the rules are written in a, in a somewhat, uh, you know, asymmetric way. Um, you know, we saw in the case of the IPR rules that I talked about earlier that they're written, you know, obviously with the interests of, of rights holders in mind, you know, the likes of Big Pharma, which is obviously concentrated in the global north. But yeah, you have similar rules on, on, on investment and services that, you know, arguably restrict, you know, policy space. Um, and of course, the Doha round agenda was dogged for a long time by the fact that, you know, there was a perception that, you know, this was about, you know, you know, developed country interests in tightening the rules and, and restricting policy space and also pushing for liberalization in, 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 you know, manufactured goods while not really tackling the sort of concerns of, of developing countries. Um, which is not to say that there aren't differences of opinion within developing countries as to what position to adopt. But I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying here, of course. Um, and so, you know, where does that leave things now? I guess the problem now is that we've got this sort of, you know, discourse of securitization sort of creeping in. Um, but also, of course, you know, continued advocacy of the system. Um, so, you know, I guess what you get is a messy picture, which, you know, doesn't spell the end of the WTO, but in a way means that the WTO is part of a sort of much more intricate and 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 intricate sounds nice. I mean, messy, you know, <laughs> picture, you know, where you have bilaterals, you know, coexisting, you know, there's increasing trend bilaterals coexisting with with the WTO with with an appellate body that 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 can't make decisions, um, which undermines, of course, the so the whole you know um, dispute settlement function of the WTO. Um, and of course, an increasing, let's call it geopolitical dimension to trade, um, which I think is manifested most prominently in the case of China uh, and arguably its um, Belt and Road Initiative, right, the BRI, um, which is, of course, focused on, 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 on you know, strategic investment uh, in, in infrastructures and, and sectors that are quite important, like, like communications. Right. So, um, you know, this all this all, you know, becomes quite problematic. Um, in a sense, because, you know, I don't think this, the, the appellate body crisis, you know, is going to be resolved, is easy to resolve necessarily, because, you know, although, you know, it sort of blew up under Trump, you know, there's an underlying, you know, US reticence about the appellate body and the perception that, you know, this body, it, you know, goes beyond its remit um, to go for very, really expansive interpretations of WTO law, which impinge on US interests and US sovereignty. Um, similarly, you know, it's sort of, you know, given the appellate body is weak, you know, doesn't exist, you know, isn't operating, you know, that of course increases the incentives to sort of, you know, negotiate bilateral agreements. Um, you know, notably recently the EU, EU had a, a reached an agreement in principle with China on investment agreement. Um, and, you know, with COVID and the sort of securitized discourse, I think while I don't think there's going to be a complete reshoring of production 
you know. Um, I think in certain areas, you know, there's certainly going to be a push towards, um, you know, narrowing and shortening supply chains. So, you know, one example would be probably, you know, the area of rare earths, right? You know, rare earths, you know, China's the big export of rare earths. Um, and, you know, these are important to produce car batteries, right? Car batteries are important because, you know, we're supposed to move towards, um, you know, uh, electric cars, you know. Uh, and so in the European Union's case, there's really, I think, an attempt to sort of, you know, reshore production chains around, you know, electric vehicles. Um, so, yeah, you know, the point is, you know, all of this, um, you know, has implications for, you know, developing countries that have, you know, historically been part of these supply chains. And of course, you know, it's not it's not to say that these supply chains have sort of been un unambiguously positive in terms of their developmental impact, but simply removing them, you know, as in the case of COVID, you know, happened quite suddenly in a number of areas, you know, I think textile, textiles, for example, yeah. is also not. Um, and so I guess my, my, my sort of overarching point would be here, um, and the same applies, for example, to discussions around carbon border adjustment taxes, right, in the EU and the US. I mean, I don't think these are things, this is necessarily a negative thing. I just, you know, it has implications for developing countries that aren't necessarily being factored into policy making and in, into the design of these policies. So my, my, my overarching point here would be that the current architecture kind of, I think, cry or the current conjecture and architecture crowds out, you know, the sort of legitimate concerns around around development um, and, um, you know, the sort of, I don't know if to call it the spirit of Doha, but I mean, the whole idea of the sort of round that's now in the doldrums, the latest round of multilateral trade talks was to address the concerns of developing countries. And that, you know, seems to have, have gone down the agenda. I mean, one key example here is is um, is the idea, I mean, you know, for me, for example, is the is the fact that the EU, EU calls its, um, its chapters tackling with environmental issues, sustainable development chapters. Right. They are predominantly, in my view, reading anyway, about environmental issues. And of course, environmental issues are key, are very important, but the sort of development side of it, I think, gets gets really neglected. Okay. Great. Well, I mean, I think so. So, just if you were a betting person, <laughs> <laughs> and given that uh, the dispute uh, settlement sort of bit of the WTO is so undermined now by sort of mm -hmm. you know starting not just with Trump but with Obama, wasn't it that he he didn't appoint anybody to pro. Uh, I, I read sort of, you know, to, mm -hmm. to the bench and now they are stopping the South Korean to be confirmed, et cetera. So, so I mean, like without that, which was like at the heart of the WTO, I mean, if you were a betting person, do you think it'll survive this phase or um, do you think it's kind of with bilateralism, multilateral, blah, blah, it's just going to dissipate? No, I mean, I don't think it'll disappear. I mean, for example, the European Union has gotten together with a bunch of other countries and sort of come up with a sort of workaround, you know, while the appellate body isn't sitting. Um, it, it's just that, you know, rather than having a neat yeah. multilateral, it, you know, becomes part of a messier picture. But I, I don't think the WTO is going to go away. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, bilateral agreements often also incorporate relevant provisions in the, w of the WTO into a bilateral setting. Um, which, of course, means that they're also subject to bilateral dispute settlement mechanisms, which, you know, in some ways maybe, you know, becomes a sort of way of enforcing the WTO through these bilateral agreements. Yeah. But no, I don't think the WTO is, is going to go away. Um, it's just that, you know, the panorama is, is, messy, uh, is, sorry, is, is messier um, and, you know, is layered, you know, and um, yeah, that's potentially bad news as, in the way that it's currently sort of looking, I think. Yes, and bad news for the less powerful, as you have been saying. So thanks so much, Gabe, for, for this is really interesting. And it was personally interesting for me because sort of, you know, I've been sort of, we've been talking about and I learned to say TTIP because I always say TTIP. I it's don't either, really. I just say TTIP <laughs> because I had to say it a lot. And it's yes. No, but thank you so very much for your time and and also the clarity with which you have explained things. So which I'm sure the students would um, appreciate. So thanks very much. No, thank you, Shirin. It's a real pleasure. Really oh. enjoyed it. Okay.